Good morning, listeners. Yes, it's still morning. How are you today? I know in a lot of different places around the world where this, well, every place, I guess, this podcast can be reached unless you don't have access to a free internet. So, hello to everyone that can listen to it. And uh, sorry, Ace, I know I haven't figured out how to... uh, do the live chat thing, but I'm going to try to send a message to people to say that you can can chat live on text. Chat live on on Spreaker. Every so often I'll get someone uh, that will come across the show and I'll say, what is this show about? You know, this guy is talking about 14th century France. What's that mean to do with a Keys bartender? Well, I happen to be a Keys bartender. And we do talk about bar stuff. From time to time. From time to time. Once again, last night, we had tourists from... Oh, this was an interesting conversation. I asked them, where are you guys from? It was a younger couple, I guess, late 20s, and uh, attractive couple. I asked him, where are you from? And the guy says, PA. And I go, my hands go up, like, further and asking. He goes, no, PA. And I go, yeah, yeah, I understand PA. Give me some more information. He goes, Pennsylvania. I said, well, I understand what PA meant. What region? He goes, outside Philadelphia. And they said, well, everything's outside Philadelphia. Meaning, well, except for Philadelphia, everything else in Pennsylvania is outside Philadelphia. So I need more information. Then he goes, "Uh, Lancaster. I go, oh, okay. Well, yeah, that's closer to Philadelphia than it is, let's say, Harrisburg or State College, Pennsylvania. But... That wouldn't be something I would call outside Philadelphia necessarily. Just like Atlantic City is an outside New York. Right? So, but I guess it's the closest big city you want to go. But actually, I think Lancaster may be even closer to uh, Baltimore. No, outside Baltimore, Pennsylvania. You know, because it's right over the border. Which is interesting. Every time someone, you know, they... They give an area they're near, they give a proximity. Like if they're near Chicago, Chicago, Detroit, uh, Canada, Canada thing. They just give their province and, you know, you, they, Canada's huge. Second biggest country in the world, right? And it is huge in distances between. So some of these people live far away from towns that you might be familiar with. But that's a fun pastime, trying to guess where people are from, listen to their accents. I can't really pick up, I can pick up a New York accent or a Boston accent, New England type accent, obviously Southern accent. Some people have, you can tell they're from rural part of some place, not so much Florida. You get some Southern accents in Florida, it's more like Panhandle. Gainesville area. Uh, I think what happened recently, and I'm not a a linguist in the most favored sense of the uh, definition, but along the East Coast, there just seems to be East Coast accent in some of the big cities. You know, we got Atlanta... Charlotte, uh, Asheville, Raleigh, these big cities. And a lot of times people that grew up in or around these big cities, they don't really have strong accents that really kind of, you know, place that they put that little pin in the map for me. Philadelphia has that. South Philadelphia. Inner city, I guess... I don't know what the nuances for that is. 
why the Bronx would have uh, and Brooklyn would have a strong accent or Yonkers or Staten Island, but Manhattan wouldn't. As well goes for the rest of Philadelphia. I spent a lot of time in Philadelphia. I am told I have somewhat of an accent. I definitely have a North, you know, kind of a mid-Atlantic accent. Definitely with nuances of Philadelphia, but I wouldn't have to say it's a strong Philadelphia accent. So trying to place people when you hear an accent, I'm trying to say, I can tell where you're from. I can tell by your, you know, if you have a British accent, you're from Britain or some of more more Irish, Scottish accents. Don't get too many Australians too often. But uh, it is a favorite pastime, and then I'm, I'm usually never surprised unless it's some obscure, when you run into an obscure group. Like if someone comes in and they're actually from Albania or Croatia, you know, just a small place, and you can just go, oh, wow, that's very unique. Uh, I run into some Czech people. Actually, Czech isn't that unique down here. There's a lot of Czech people. So, and I always assume, said, oh, do you live down, I'll ask, even if they have an accent, this would be the first thing, do you live down here? And they go, no, like surprised. And I said, listen, the reason I ask is that there are, are large, you know, large proportion of the people that live down here are from someplace else. So it's not unusual to hear an accent that is not native from here. And you really can't tell sometimes when someone grew up down here in Miami if they're from here or they're from Maryland or Delaware. It's I know it's a big distance away, but I really can't tell. I don't know the California accent, Arizona, things like that. Just not. Midwestern, North Central Plains, sometimes you kind of get that. But they they're very transient too. People are transient nowadays. They're all over the place. The families are all over. I heard this story on This American Life where a father put his extended family, the children and, and grandchildren in his family onto a map and he would pin them wherever they go and he would pick a statistical average in the uh, on the planet where everyone is. So if the central part, they could say right now, Kansas, Kansas used to be the central part of the United States, uh, the population center, but I think I moved more west and south. Uh, if it was in Kansas, he said, today it's in Kansas. And, you know, just the thing he does all the time, he takes his, I don't know how he generates the, thing, but he just generates that. Well, those lovely people from outside Philadelphia, Lancaster County, which is Pennsylvania Dutch country, they asked for drinks, and they said, can we see a drink menu? And for some reason, every time I hear a drink menu, it seems kind of a, I take it slightly as an insult, meaning Oh, you look to be an older man. We don't know how long you bartended, but we want to see what's on your menu here. Just like if you went to Fridays and look at the drink menu there. And I gave them the menu and they go, and they asked for something and uh, I gave it to them off the menu. But whatever, margarita and another drink. Forget what the other drink was. But then later on, they wanted to try something different. And I said, okay, well, I can make a lot of different. Tell me a little about what you'd be interested in. And he didn't really tell me much. And and then someone across the bar said, you should try the peanut butter martini. And he said, well, I have one that I like. And you have the ingredients, it looks like. You can make it. And I made it. It was a white Russian with screwball peanut butter whiskey. So I made that. It seemed, it seemed like an interesting drink. It definitely would probably mix all right. And then I just made a little small portion because the person suggested over there they wanted to have a little taste of it. I made a little sample for everyone there. 
And they said, well, this is what he's talking about. The gentleman across the bar when he suggested the peanut butter martini. And I think I had a convert. So I like that. I said, try to make that. And I tell him the ingredients and all that stuff. And he said, now whenever you go someplace, you have a, you have a drink you can make. That's really good. And it's kind of out of, you know, it's out of the ordinary whenever you have to put peanut butter in a blender. So it's nice to give. It was a gift I can give someone that really doesn't cost anything. The gift of knowledge. The gift of knowledge. So besides that, people say, well, what's your favorite drink? And then I go and say, yeah, I want my favorite drink. Uh, I used to like gimlets. I used to like this. And you say used to. And he said, what do you drink now? I said, I don't drink anything. And they said, what do you mean? I, I, said, I said, I don't drink. And they said, um, oh, really? That must be hard to do. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, I guess it might be. I, I don't really particularly find it hard to do. Though I did, you know, I, did, I do go to my uh, 12-step meetings. You know what it is. The ones that, the same group that would be in front of uh of the phone book. And they had the commercials. They actually, AA has commercials on the radio, so I figure I can say AA. So I go to AA meetings every so often. I went to one this morning. And, uh, but I'm, I don't talk about what goes on in the meetings. So it, the meetings were the things that happen in the meetings actually help me stay sober. Um, and if you do have an issue with that, and I know some of the listeners on the show are sober. And I do appreciate that. And I know I do talk about drinks and all this stuff. Yeah, the drinks can still be delicious and you can still enjoy them. But for some of us, it's not a thing that you can enjoy. Because it doesn't lead to joy. It's just like for the diabetic with sugar. Right? Or uh, anything, anything that you're allergic to. It's not exactly a poison once it won't kill you and things like that, but it is the long-term exposure that I learned through hard lessons in life, the first 44 years of my life, and then was sober for seven years. And then taking that for granted, taking my sobriety for granted, and thinking, well, it would be okay for me to drink because people that are drinking seem to have a good time. Well, my drinking sometimes led to some good times, but ultimately in the end, there was very little return for the investment. And I just made it as, uh, besides doing the work I needed to do not to drink, uh, and and that there is work to be done not to drink and to stay sober, but being able to accept in your head that you, drinking is not for you and not being, uh, for me, not being jealous of the people that can through the person that can say, oh, I'll have a glass of wine. And then when they're done, the glass of wine to, or put the glass down and sometimes not drink all the wine and just walk away. That um, That's, you know, used to seem amazing to me and I realized this is one of those things. It's one of those things that's not for me right now. And and people, and every so often I get the chance to talk to people that seem to have difficulties. And the difficulties do come from the thing that I legally dispense. Alcoholic libations and refreshments. I don't stop in the middle when someone I notice they drink every day and they usually drink at least with me four or five drinks knowing it's not the end of the line for them four or five drinks was me being reasonable was me being a reasonable drinker because I would I do a lot more and I drink uh, if I drank four or five drinks at home the portions were too you know, twice as big as you normally get out. Maybe sometimes three times. And then you stop adding a mixer and all that stuff. And that's the way it was with me. But for other people, I'm like, you know, you normally hear 
every day. If you're not here, I imagine you're someplace else by the habit. And you, you don't seem to be any happier for this. Maybe you should think about doing something different. Maybe you should do something different. It's not, it's not for everyone. Do you, do you have a lot of issues in your life and things like that? And you can't really explain why they're like that. Or you, if you do, you place it on someone else's shoulders to blame. And uh, sometimes they place the blame on their own. Sometimes they place it on someone else's situation, a person, and things like that. But when the, the, the real problem and solution is right in front of them. It's pushing, pushing the drink away. And sometimes it's really hard to tell when you should say that. When, when should you say it to someone when you get to know a regular and you see that they're doing it and they're, you're, they're a source of your income? They come in, you say, if they come in every day and they tip you 10 bucks every day. Now, whether you share or split tips, so that, that could work out to be too, you know, the moderate tipper and someone that's there for, you know, tips $10 every time they come in or five, $5. It's anywhere from a thousand to two, you know, $2,000 a week. I mean, $2,000 a year. String that together with all the other people and that's, that's your income. And you try saying goodbye to 2%, 1 or 2% of your income. Try saying that. But in the end, you know, it isn't about losing income. It's about, for at least the peace of mind, it's trying to make someone's life a little better. And if you got a chance, if you do spend time talking to someone and they're a regular and you care about them and you care about their well-being, that sometimes it could be and say, hey, listen, you know, maybe you should do this. You know, if you ever have an issue... Maybe I can go with you. Would you like to come to a meeting with me or something like that? And that's one way or another, you're going to make someone into a non-customer, meaning they'll stop going. They'll stop going to the bar if they feel they're being pushed. But I'm more of like the introduction. I like the introduction. And there was a gentleman who called me. Uh, last week to make a reservation for his family and he thanked me for talking to him and I couldn't remember what I said to him and I said well you're welcome he says listen I was drinking a lot at that time and you you told me how maybe I should look into not drinking that's not a way to handle the problems and you're not going to feel any better in the end and all that stuff he said to me and I said oh well, okay good and I said did it help he goes yeah it's okay and at least when he came in I, I mean I, did, I don't police people's drinking or anything like that but I didn't see it was drinking but I, I did maybe maybe in this case when he wasn't he was going through a separation I don't know if he ended up getting divorced or not but he was pretty broken up about the breakup and he was intoxicated every time I seen him intoxicated not slightly but very intoxicated he lived down the street too so he didn't drive here. When I say he lived down the street, he lived literally four or five houses down the street. And that, that I always was amazed by people using that excuse. But I live in the neighborhood. And I said, I don't want you to become intoxicated if you live in the building. <laughs> if you live in the building, I don't want you to. I dropped off people before. I haven't seen this one young fella who uh, I drove uh, last year and I helped him into his house and he had uh, barely made it to his door and I got him in the door and I was thinking, man, I got to walk him to his chair. And he says, I'm not going to sleep or anything like that. And he just started stumbling around. I said, well, you're in your house, right? He goes, yes. And I go, okay. So I turned around and I felt and I haven't seen him since, but I know he's alive. I've asked people that. He's still alive. Yeah, he just hasn't been in. You're not going to be able to help everyone, but you can tell people that they're, you know, you care. You can tell them you care. It's just 
such a difficult decision to make on how you would do that and how you would stop someone someone from doing something that they shouldn't be doing. But And when I say they shouldn't be doing it, they shouldn't be harming themselves. In the end, that's all it is, harming themselves. And I'm not saying all drinking is harming yourself. I'm just saying some people seem to have an issue with it. And it's my responsibility because of the lifestyle I've chosen to really let them know that uh, there is just another possibility. And you can tell them that. You can tell them that if you're a sober person or even if you're a drinking person because you could be drinking fine. You say, listen, if you have an issue, maybe you need need some help because there's some people that just don't put it down. It's not an attack on people's drinking. It's not an attack. It's an aid for people who need help. So don't think of an attack or an assault. And... Uh, you know, it's funny because the radio station I mentioned that advertises for AA in uh, here in the Upper Keys. And they actually have, like, there's many commercial breaks where I hear two commercials that say, two commercials following each other, one following the other for AA. And, I mean, I guess it's because people acknowledge down here that there is a certain bar uh, when I say bar, I meant level to ha- where people accept heavy drinking down here. And it can get kind of brutal because of how thoroughly it runs through people's lives down here. And the devastation it starts and stuff like that. And it just, you know, you, you, you know people that it seems like they're drinking in spite of their family drinking despite them or in just to ignore them to belie their responsibilities and it's nothing like that there are people there are people with problems they don't do it because they don't love their family sometimes they do it more because they love their family because they feel deeper shame and pain because of the pain they're creating from the things they're doing. It's kind of like a, a endless circle of binging and drinking and shame and hurt and guilt and just back and forth feeding upon itself. And it's hard to get off that merry-go-round. And it's people that drink themselves to death or use substances till death. But it wasn't with an expectation of hurting their family. I'm not talking intentionally. I'm talking about that it's just a byproduct of, of this thing. Whether you want to call it a disease, obsession, an allergy, whatever. It's real and it happens and we can do something about it. No, it's kind of sad, but it's also uplifting when you know you can say something. Even when you have a drink in your hand. Even if you have a drink in your hand, you no no reason to say, hey, listen, if this is causing you a problem, maybe you should stop doing this thing. Like, I teach spin. I, I coach it. Let's spin. And if someone has pain sitting in a chair in on the seat, the bike seat, and they have pain doing the whole exercise and they don't get anything from it I will say maybe this exercise is not for you maybe there's other ones you can do it's not for everyone it really isn't that what I'm saying about this in this case like I, I do a full workout when I go there and I do sit ups I do back exercises sometimes people have issues with their backs they can't do that they have to strengthen other muscles in their body. There's other things they could do to get in shape. And there's other things people can do in order to have a good time and blow off steam. I, for one, like the podcast. I like to work out. And I'm able to do both those things. And I'm able to do a little more. A little more because I'm... I took away a thing that was kind of a barrier to me. And I still have... I'm not... I don't have all the answers I don't have uh, 
I still have a lot of human failings. But that one particular one that wasn't helping me, I got rid of that. Got rid of the smoke, good toe. But there's other things. I'm a, a heavy procrastinator. Heavy procrastinator. Heavy. High procrastinator. Whatever you want to call it. I'm not high when I procrastinate. I'm just a procrastinator. So I'm going to let that at that. And I want to talk about one other thing that's really kind of interesting. The weather. I'm not going to talk about the weather like I said. But people's reaction to it. It's amazing. It is amazing. And the the people down here, what they're accustomed to, just like in the Northeast, if you're in if you live in a ski resort, a little snow is a good thing. A lot of snow is a good thing. They say, Well, listen, we know how to remove the snow, you know, when there's a lot of snow here, we get a lot of people to come to ski. Supposedly there's a big problem in a lot of resorts now that have uh, some good snowpack and they're overselling these lift tickets and the lift lines are so like incredible. They said they're hour long, hours long, whatever to get on ski slopes. But uh, I'm not talking. I'm talking about the weather. So down here, hurricanes. You're used to hurricanes. People don't freak out and live down here. They just button up their house. They go to either stay or they go. Some people are a little more reckless and they decide to stay in places that maybe they shouldn't stay in or sometimes they stay, you know, in spite of the warnings to leave. They want, it, um, they want everyone to leave so they could, everyone could, you know, if emergency responders don't have to go and respond to all these people that are stuck. Like if they're flooded and houses are destroyed and stuff like that, you don't have a lot of people on hand that you have to take care of. In a disaster area. So yeah, hurricanes, people don't make a big deal. They go and pack up, they button up their house, they go and get supplies, they plan their uh, evacuation. All matter of factly. All matter of factly, like it's nothing. When you're talking about sometimes winds of 150 miles an hour, sustained winds of 150 miles an hour. And if you've never been through a hurricane, man, it does sound, it sounds like a, a train. Uh, it sounds like a 500 mile long train going by you at 60 miles, 70 miles an hour. Because it would take you, take it that long to get by you, seven hours. Seven, eight hours to get by you. And you're thinking, wow, man, when's this sucker going to end? It just goes and goes and goes. And sometimes when the eye goes through, it just dies down. And people put up with it. And I'm actually used to it. Now I hear the crack. I know it's not thunder. I know that's a tree. You wait for a tree to hit your house. Something like that. I'm not talking about that. I stayed I stayed through a tropical storm, almost category one. Was it two years ago? Something like that. Or a year, a year and a half ago. But <clears throat> with the cold, with the cold, it's so unique to the people down here. I don't know how long you have to live down here to get acclimated. I'm thinking it's just a season or two. And luckily, we had some cool weather already, so people have been exposed to it and they're starting to get it. But they're just projecting uh, tomorrow night that a cold front's moving in and it's going to get into the 40s, the mid-40s maybe down here, the upper 30s in Miami and Fort Lauderdale, like 37, 38. Some possibility of freezing temperatures, which is devastating, devastating, not necessarily people to the flora and the fauna down here. Just not used to it. And we joke about the iguanas and stuff like that. They are going to, some of them will die just from the process of being the cold shock. It just, they can't, they're just not used to sustained cold. And they go dormant and their body can handle a certain amount of cool weather exposure. But the people down here, they freak out. And there's good reason for some of them. Because they're not ready. Some don't have the coats. They just, their blood is thin. They just don't have the tolerance I mean, dive boats, it sucks for those dive boats and people that are fishing, fishermen. Down here, if you don't have the cold weather gear going out on the water, it sucks when it's cold. 
It's not like the deadliest catch. I mean, I guess maybe they have some of the clothes where they can. They're gonna but they're gonna button up like during the the North Pacific near Alaska with thirty three degree water fashion and you know freezing crab traps. That's what they're gonna button up like on the thing, and then and you'll see that on land too. You'll see gloves and hats. I'm not necessarily a hat wearer until it's like below freezing. I don't cover up my ears until it's below freezing. But yeah, they are all ballsy and brave when it's a hurricane or flooding or rain or thunderstorm or a giant a giant crocodile crawling in your backyard. But man, a little cool weather, people freak the fuck out. Right. And then we get the people to come down here from the other places. We come down here, it was zero. It was 10 degrees below zero, and it's 55 degrees right now here, and we're all right with that. People go, yeah, it would have been nice if it was 70, 80 degrees, but we're all right with that. Today we're in the upper 70s. I think we'll probably be in the mid 70s tomorrow, maybe low 70s. But the um, it's, it's just amazing that the power of perception where you're coming from is that and then there's people I met a lovely young lady from the Philippines from the southern Philippines and she she said 60 degrees is intolerable for her intolerable she was a little thing beautiful young lady. um yeah but and I can see it I can see it I, I understand where people when they don't when they, they're approached by things they normally don't contemplate, and here it's cold weather. I worked at a resort here, kind of rustic, before they did a big remodel. Uh, they had a t- I was working in Tiki Bar, and at 8 o'clock, around 8 o'clock, 7, 8 o'clock, the front desk would close, and they'd bring a bunch of envelopes up front, and they say, these are the rooms we have available with the keys, and there's a contract they can sign and all that stuff, just take and charge them for the night, and things like that. And I go, okay. Well, one particular night, it dropped into the 40s. And I had people come in and said, we need blankets. And I said, I don't have access to blankets. I asked the guy, our security guy, do we have blankets around here? He said, I got some blankets. He brings these thin-ass blankets. And then someone comes back and says, my heat doesn't work. And they go, look, there is no heat setting on, there's no heat in the rooms. In, in this group of rooms, they had no heat. There was no, no possibility of heat. It wasn't that thing wasn't working. They didn't have the thing. They just didn't, they thought, how many times a year, 10, 15 days out of a year, they might need it. Well, they didn't. They didn't invest in that at that time, and it was nothing like telling somebody. And I was not happy with telling somebody, and they were very upset. And they needed to be someone upset at. And I said, I realize you need to be upset, but I am the bartender. I don't know much about. I don't know anything about the hotel operation other than they bring me these envelopes to sell the rooms. I tell you the rooms that are available, and I don't think it's worth it. And I'm not. And they didn't give me at that time. They didn't give me a a way to be able to give a refund. And and there were people leaving, and they said, "Well, we're leaving." And I said, "We'll ask for it." And I said, "I'll write down that you left and all that stuff." And I'm sh- I'm sure they'll do their best to accommodate you with that. I'm sorry, I can't. I'm just a bartender right here. And I'm just always saying, I'm just a bartender. I just don't have. I'm not the owner. So, and some people don't, they really, when they're really angry, they just need a sounding board for it. You just say, I understand. You want to say that? Yes, yes, yes. And some people are offended when someone takes it out on them. Ah, me, not so much. You know, so, hey, listen, it's rain, you know, when they piss up, the weather's been shitty down here. And they look at you and they go, it's so bad. Sucks. I can't go diving. So I, hmm, okay. I'll see. Listen, I will talk to my superiors about the weather. 
We'll see if we can do something about it. And sometimes I'll go, are you trying to be a smart ass? No, I'm not trying. It comes naturally. Well, thank you very much, folks, for listening. We are still on target for 1 million downloads. I do like, uh, I do like and love and appreciate that you are uh, listening and sharing and downloading. I, I'd like to thank uh, my hometown of Philadelphia, my adopted town of Key Largo, Key West, Marathon, Miami, Ocala, Gainesville, uh, Dover, Delaware, I did say Philadelphia, New York, Taiwan, India, Austria, Australia, Ireland, Britain, France, Bulgaria, Russia, Ukraine, Poland, did I say France? France, United Kingdom, uh, all those places, Canada. Thank you all for listening. Thanks for sharing, and I hope you have a great day. This is Jim the Keys Bartender signing out. Bye. <laughs>